you know something? Your favorite TV show, Step Up, is back. And it's all going to be electrifying this new season on the Joy Prime channel. And it's proudly brought to you by Syntex Tank. So let's step up with Syntex Tank. Just prepare yourself for that exhilarating journey as contestants battle it out every week by answering trivia questions and also getting a chance to pocket cash prizes ranging from uh, 5,400 Ghana cities all the way up to a staggering 6,000 Ghana cities along with a treasure uh, trove of fantastic products from our esteemed sponsors. But that's not all. Now, this season, as a viewer, keep your eyes on that thrilling Syntex Tank question of the week and be the first to correctly answer, uh, you know, all of these uh, questions. And, uh, you know, the prizes are graciously provided by our sponsors. And here's to the ultimate incentive as well. As a viewer who consistently and swiftly answers most of the questions correctly throughout the season, you will walk away with the magnificent 65-inch Samsung television. Step up with Syntex Tank. And uh, this promises to be an unparalleled television experience. And it promises entertainment, excitement, and incredible rewards. So join us this and every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. as we embark on this unforgettable journey. It's proudly sponsored by Bell Ice, MTN Momo, Angel Cola, and powered by Syntex Tank. Join Prime, the ultimate experience. And of course, my man and your man, George Quay, will be in the center of all of the action. So, uh, once again, you're welcome to the Joy Sports link, and I'll take you back to those moments at the Labadi Beach Hotel as the team engaged our industry uh, specialists and experts uh, on ways on how to repurpose our approach to our football development here in the country. Special welcome to all of you listening welcome to us on Joy 99.7 FM and watching us on the Joy News Channel. My name is Razak Musbao and, and this is a special occasion. It's a thought leadership event and is brought to you by Joy Sports and also Joy Business. Well, I'm doing this with my colleague Bufthan Abile. You're going to see him shortly. But today we have a very, very important conversation. We're exploring the Ghana Premier League and also looking at the Saudi Arabian experience. What they are Arabian doing they are in doing the sporting environment, and, environment. And, and to see how best we could take a cue from it and help develop Ghana football. Develop well, Ghana well football. today we are well, live from the Labadi Beach, Beach Hotel, and, and uh, you're going to see some uh, of the finest brains in Ghana whom we have assembled here to help us with the discussion. And just gone by where the Dan has supporters, where the Dan has supporters union, and let's put a round of applause to just appreciate them for the wonderful performance they put together yep so we're gonna have a very exciting conversation we want you to be part of it so just head to uh, Twitter and uh, just use the hashtag joy sports or joy business leave your comments there and be part of the conversation we'll definitely get it across uh, in the course of the show well to help us appreciate why we are gathered here is the head of Joy Business, Mr. Charles Nixon. Let's welcome him with a round of applause as he comes to share with us the purpose of our gathering. It's exciting seeing all these great players in the Ghanaian business and sports industries here today. Some of these individuals are direct investors, while others are contributing in various ways to enhance the game of football in Ghana. Indeed, today marks a significant milestone in our endeavor to transform football into a thriving commercial entity that can consistently contribute to Ghana's economy. In 2022, the global sports tourism market was valued at a staggering $587.8 billion, a testament to the growing popularity of sporting events worldwide. Events like the Olympics, the FIFA World Cup, the NBA, and others have played a pivotal role in propelling this industry forward. Nations such as Saudi Arabia and China have recognized the immense potential of football and have made substantial investments to attract top football talent, thus boosting tourism and economic growth. Importantly, football has evolved into a major economic force in many countries across the globe. 
to illustrate the English Premiership League, even amidst the challenges posed by the pandemic during the 2019-2020 football season, contributed a remarkable £7.6 billion to the UK economy and supported 94,000 jobs. Similar success stories can be found in Germany, Spain, and France, where football has become a thriving industry, fostering job creation and economic development through various value chain businesses. Regrettably, the same cannot be said for Ghana. We fondly remember the days when our stadiums were packed to capacity, fans proudly adorned their club's jerseys, and football was the talk of the town. I remember when myself and my dad, at the age of 10, were visiting the Accra Sports Stadium to cheer our beloved Accra House of Folk to victory. But what has led to the decline of this beautiful game in our nation? How can we reignite the passion and properly brand football to make it not only appealing, but also a significant revenue generator? Finding a solution to these questions will not only attract corporate support for football clubs, but also result in substantial growth through talent development, infrastructure improvement, enhanced brand equity, and the positioning of Ghanaian football as an attractive global brand. In closing, I implore all of you present today, as well as those tuning in through Joy FM 99.7, Joy News, and our social media platforms to actively contribute to your ideas and recommendations. Together, let's pave the way for a new era in Ghana football, one that boasts world-class infrastructure, job opportunities, heightened brand value, and much more. Thank you, and I wish all of us a fruitful deliberation. And that's uh, Mr. Charles Nixon. He's the head of business at uh, Joy News, Joy, Joy FM, and Joy Prime. And uh, very, very interesting conversation there. So today we are looking at repurposing our approach to football development, uh, looking at the Saudi Arabian experience. Let me introduce my colleague who's going to help us in this, uh, who's going to be helping me in today's discussion, Muftal Nabila Abdullahi. He's the host of Prime Take and also uh, presenter on AM and join us today. Let's appreciate Muftal as he joins me. Thank you. 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 Yeah, um, so Muftal, uh, we have a very exciting discussion to have exciting today. Exciting discussion. And um, just last week, I, when I was doing the AM show, mm. I was um, one of my stories was from the Tishi. Uh, Aswitef that recently you mm. unveiled and I heard him mention that football is a multi-billion dollar industry. Yep. Why is Ghana not taking advantage of that? Is, if it is a multi-billion dollar industry, then there's something that we are not tapping. Mm. Um, have we positioned ourselves in a way that the corporate world will be willing to invest? in the game and give talent the opportunities. He mentioned that he has constructed about five AstroTurfs mm. and he wants to do more. Yeah. They've got about seven footballers out there and very soon we'll hear their names. Hopefully you mentioned the names here for us, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> so um, with you up there, uh, to just to have an uh, interesting, interesting conversation. Yeah. Uh, my media right is our boss, our editor, Gary Al Smith. <laughs> yeah. give, uh, give me a round of applause, Gary Al Smith. <laughs> Um, I'm sure you've been reading from him, from CNN, from BBC, Supersport, everywhere. Gary Osmit is a well-traveled sports journalist. <laughs> it's a well-traveled sports journalist, yeah. yeah. And Prof. Robert Hinson, uh, professor of marketing, and uh, he's also the Pro Vice Chancellor of um, University of Communications and Technology. Thanks very much for your time. <laughs> for <getting there. laughs> And in the middle is the executive chairman of McDan Group. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he's, he's already said it. Football is a multi-billion dollar industry. He's been investing in football. And uh, I remember in 2017, I had the privilege of meeting him in his house. He has a very large tennis court there. If you haven't been there, <laughs> you need to go there and see it. And he said something quite interesting, that if you don't invest in the youth today, what you think you have 
doesn't belong to you. They'll come and take it away from you someday. So you need to invest in the youth if you want to give them opportunities. And he's a businessman, someone who's done it. I remember recently when I was listening to him talk about when he was doing his master program. One day he looked at his bank balance. I was like, ah. <laughs> Why am I struggling to go and do a master program when I have this amount of money in my bank account? <laughs> so yeah, so definitely he's someone who is willing to invest in the youth. Do we have the talent? Yes. It's an obvious question. Every day we talk about Ghana being a football nation. If we are a football nation, we need to create a platform for the talents to be on earth. <coughs> and tonight here with us is Macdan. <laughs> In 2010, Africa had the opportunity to host the FIFA World Cup. It was the first time ever. And many of us will recall, Ghana made it to the quarterfinal. But there's the other part you don't want to remember. So I'll not talk about that. <laughs> and FIFA decided that there was a man in Ghana who had the brain to be able to spearhead the marketing of the competition. And he's also a former chief executive officer of Accra House of Folk, Neil Armstrong Motabe. <laughs> Before we started, you heard his voice. So that's that good. <laughs> <laughs> My colleague on the Joy Sports desk, and he's a host of uh, Sports Now on Joy Prime, and also uh, Joy News Prime uh, on the Joy News channel. Yeah, have a I mean, good conversation. I think evidently we have pretty much the right people to engage in this conversation. Perfect. Us, Perfect. You know, we could have assembled the best brains mm. to be able to share with us. There yeah. are 1,001 people out there yeah. who also have got ideas of how we can develop football in this country. And mm -hmm. as you mentioned earlier, this is a conversation that is open to everyone. They can share their thoughts with us using the hashtag Joy Taught Leadership so that we can read out to you. Um, if you have questions too, you can send them across and then our panel yeah. will do the honors of answering those questions. Well, we're gonna get the grounds running now and we're gonna start with uh, it's okay to call you my boss, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> He's got to ask me. He's got to ask me. <laughs> I, I never yes. like to be called the boss. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to start with Gary Alsmith. Gary, you have traveled around the world. You've seen the experience of England. You've seen the experience of Spain. You've seen the experience of Italy. And coming up now is the experience of Saudi Arabia. It's one that has gotten everybody talking. The Italians are talking about it. The English are talking about it. The Spanish are talking about it. Some are calling a bluff of what they are doing. Yeah. But it does appear that they have a plan and they're executing it, you know, to the awe of everybody. Yeah. Help us appreciate exactly what is happening in Saudi Arabia as far as their football is concerned at the moment. It's a, it's a privilege to be here tonight. And um, I think this discussion is more than important for a few reasons. The man, because of whom everybody is talking, is only 37 years old. I need us to understand this. The visionary who has got all the major footballing powerhouses quaking in their boots and shaking is only 37 years old. He's the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, MBS. Now, at 37, he is the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia. Now, in his own words, he looked at the demographics of Saudi Arabia randomly one day on his phone. And it hit him that there was something not right about the demographics he was seeing vis-a-vis -vis the plan that the government or the, the, the ruling class of Saudi Arabia were doing. What did he think they were doing wrong? Now... He says when he looked at the population, and there are 18 million people in Saudi Arabia, right? 18 million. This big, vast country, there are 18 million human beings there. He realized that 63% of those 18 million people are below the age of 30. I need to repeat that. 63% of those 18 million people are below the age of 30. What even hit him even harder was that of that 18 million, 
50% are below the age of 25. Which means that 9 million or more of Saudi Arabia's population were 25 or below. This was in 2018. Now, he probably spoke to Dr. Daniel Macaulay, who had spoken to Muftal one year before, because Muftal says he met him in 2017, right? Yeah, yeah. And doctor told him that if you don't build things for the youth, one day what you think is yours, they'll take it. So MBS, as they called him, the crown prince decided that he cannot have 50% of the youth being under the age of 25 or 25 and below and have the Saudi authorities doing you know, some other projects are not focusing on their youth. So he commissioned research agencies to look at what the youth wanted. Overwhelmingly, sports and entertainment came top. So in order for the youth not to grow up, take guns and take his money and the rest of the ruling class's money, he decided on that day, at that time, to bring the sports they wanted to Saudi Arabia. Because remember, Saudi have a lot of money, just like Libya used to do. They take care of education. They take care of, um, you know, f education is free to the university level. Saudi citizens, when they grow up, I mean, lots of us have been to Dubai, so we know this story. In those states, after you are done with school, you are given a plot of land. You are given a house to live in as well. But if you are having all these things and you have children and they are bored, you would find something to do. And that is why, from 2018, they started pumping billions of dollars to bring sports to Saudi Arabia. Because the youth needed to be kept busy, needed to be kept entertained, and most importantly, sorry, the youth had money to spend, and they needed to spend it in something. That is why, for those of you who are sports freaks, you might realize that... Um, wrestling which all of us you know it used to be on gtv but now all the stations show it these days the biggest ref wrestling events of the year which they call wrestlemania now calls saudi arabia its home that was the first big global franchise that they bought to test the waters they spent 100 million dollars on that to buy it by a 10 year period so that every year you know wrestlemania they do the what they call the raw the SmackDown, all those are like qualifiers. And then WrestleMania is like the World Cup. They do it. In fact, just to give you an idea of how serious Saudi is, when I started going to South Africa around um, 2010 or 2009, the wrestling, South Africa were similarly trying to attract that sort of investment, which included the World Cup. They brought WrestleMania to Johannesburg. Saudi went to the organizers of WrestleMania, that's WWE, and said, boss, what is South Africa giving you? And then they just doubled it, tripled it, and then they brought it there. So the reason why I think this is important is that just like Saudi Arabia, maybe one day one leader in Ghana will look at our own population and understand that in order for the youth not to take matters into their own hands, probably we should start investing into these things. What are our figures? Of the 31 million people that we have in our population, according to the last census, 35% are between the ages of 0 to 14. 35%. 35%. 38% 38 of our 31 million are between the ages of 15 to 35. I need that to sink in. Only 4% are over 65 years in this country. So if you spend your resources catering to the 4%, you are wasting your time. That is not to say we, should, we shouldn't take care of our aged. It's important. But it is a no-brainer that the bulk of our natural, of our national cake should go into securing the future and the busyness, not the business, but the busyness of the youth. Because if this 0 to 14 and 15 to 35 don't have anything to do in the next 10 years, you know what they say about the devil and idle hands? 
the devil will find work for the idle hand. And those are my opening remarks. Very interesting opening remarks. Let me come to uh, Prof now. Uh, Prof, just, just to add that Prof has two doctorate degrees. Oh. And Prof, when I read that, oh. when I read that, oh, wow. when I read that, I was like, wow. Oh. And hopefully when I grow up, I want to become like you. <laughs> <laughs> but Prof, let's, let's get to it though. I mean, you, you've heard the, to some extent, the context that was provided by Gary Ausmed. When you consider what is happening in Ghana, uh, what will be your assessment as opening remarks? What will be your assessment of what we've done with sports in this country to help grow our economy? I think it will be, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you, Gary. Good to see you, sir. <laughs> um, more than what I think, I'll tell you what Tony Eboa thinks. Um, there's an article I saw where he said, football in Ghana is dead. 7 June 2023, and he's saying that I don't know what's going on because I don't follow the football anymore. Everyone knows Ghana football is dead because they didn't listen to advice we gave them from the beginning. So I think they are currently facing the punishment. Then he said, if you involve bribes and stuff like that in football, you will destroy the game. Then the famous uh, Honorable Eugene Boache, who is also a big man, I think, vice chairman for youth sports, he also says that Ghana football needs some urgent change in leadership to rescue the diminishing fortunes of the sport. Then Neil Ante Van der Boy, 7 July this year, said Ghana football is designed to fail because he believes the structure of football is breeding failure. So I hear you on the youth thing, totally profound, but here's what's going to happen apart from Saudi responding to the youth demands. Yeah. Eventually, a business case will be built. So when Manchester City makes 731 million euro last year, and Real Madrid makes 713 million euro last year, they joined it begin two years ago. Yeah. So there's something about a systematic buildup that can start from investment in youth. But as the sports ecosystem builds. You have certain spillover effects. Look, in, when Hearts won the Champions League early 2000, mm. I was working in a famous agency in Adabraka called Originate with the famous Joel Nett and the late Daniel Chung. And those days, Joel had some connection with some sports market agency. They were the agency for the CAF, for CAF. So Canon was a lead sponsor. So I remember through that Canon affiliation, we managed to get Canon, ASA, Symantec, Microsoft, and APC for a month for four. This is tw to 20 years ago. Yeah. So I'm very much aware about how a certain brand appeal, a certain marketing acumen builds the sports proposition, whether it's football or basketball or baseball. Yeah. But here's my challenge. I think that when you take the global infrastructure, FIFA, then you have continental infrastructure, then you have the local football associations, I'm not too sure if the interlinkages are to our benefit, and I'll explain. We are all jostling for the best football images, the best football propositions, and sometimes I wonder what the benchmark. You said the guy looked at his phone and looked at demographics. I was writing. So there's a certain sense in which research, data, insights yeah. informs this sort of decision making. I'm not too sure if it's available or not. Mm. But I remember he said he was 10. I was younger. I went to Merton. It's right next to the stadium. Then I went to Richard. So me, I started going to the stadium from as soon as I could even talk. <laughs> My uncles took me. We used to go that Sunday like 9 a.m. to watch House and Kotoko around 3. I remember his Udamtin and Sam Silante. And, and, and because I lived in Osu, I remember Salem Park. Too. They used to play over there. So I've sort of seen football grow. But I'm not too sure whether it has grown backwards or grown forward. <laughs> I'm not too sure because, no, no, for the life of me, I, I don't think I was going to go near any football match this weekend. But I saw the Man U miracle. I saw Barca come back to fight b b before the, the, the referee blew his final whistle. Mm. Why am I oscillating between the UK and Spain yeah. when I live <laughs> in Ligon? I mean, so, so, something, something is not is working. Right. Yeah. So I, I think that if, as locals, we don't consume the football product, who in Serekunda in the Gambia is coming to consume it? 
who is coming to from Vindu Kinabiba or from uh, Richard's Bay in South? No, no, nobody will consume it. So I think we need to redefine this football proposition at a basic level. And then the youth proposition makes sense. But for me, more than the youth, where's the strategy? I'm not too clear. Maybe you, you are a sports guy, you can explain to me. But I'm not too clear where, where the strategy is. Whether it's cold football or it's regional football or it's the Premier League, I'm not too sure where the strategy is. But I think that we need to redefine the football proposition and be clear on what you want to achieve. And then for what it's worth, you know we have beyond the return and after the return and all that. Yeah. I'm not too sure that football is part of our tourism proposition. I'm not too sure. Yeah. But I think that we need to think through this at a broad macro level. And then at a policy level, I agree what we want to do with the sport. It will trickle down into the various substructures. Then football can really make a difference. Those will be my opening remarks. Thank you. <laughs> Let me come to uh, Dr. Macaulay now. Doc, now, so I was just skimming through the internet and I realized that in 2021, you decided to sponsor Great Olympics to the tune of $270,000. That was massive. Then you've also decided to expend some of your resources in the establishment of AstroTevs. And just recently, you, uh, you know, the Vice President Commission and AstroTev that you built at Tishy, the Tishi Sports Complex, the tune of 30 million Ghana cities. For a businessman to be expending his resources uh, in sports infrastructure to this extent, it begs the question, why, what have you seen yeah. in Ghana football? For which reason you've decided to expend these resources? You go to England, now Manchester United is up for sale, and the billionaires are scrambling for it. Newcastle was up for sale, and we saw how they were scrambling for it. Likewise, Chelsea. Whenever a club is up for sale in England, we see billionaires scrambling for it. You come down here, um, with the exception of you and a few others, it does appear the business community is not particularly interested in the football industry in Ghana. What have you seen in Ghana football, for which reason you are expending your resources the extent, to the extent that you have done? And I'm sure you've been interacting with some of your business people. Why are they withdrawing from <laughs> the Ghana football industry? Well, thank you very much. Um, I see things differently, and um, I believe in Ghana, and I believe in the Ghanaian talent. Um, if you look at McDonald's history, we've been very consistent, and um, the way we support the youth and the sport, in, the youth in sports. Um, you cast your mind back. Football was uh, like magic in Ghana. Yeah. So I woke up one day and I asked myself, what is, what is going on? I was going to the stadium. My father was a hustle phone fan. Yeah. But I am Olympic, so. <laughs> Only daddy. <laughs> <laughs> we seem to argue a lot. And um, uh, he loved football, loved boxing. Um, if you look at what is going on in Ghana right now, we need to believe in ourselves and believe in our youth. And we have to say that we can, we can do it. Why is Magdan doing all this? One thing I cease to do in this country is to talk about problems. The problem we came to meet will continue meeting. The problem will live with the problem. A problem will always be there. So I taught myself to be a fixer. I normally don't complain. I normally don't want to talk about problems. I try to see opportunity and how to take advantage of an environment and make the best out of it. Not for myself, but for the youth and the future. So our investment into sports is heavy. And um, I am already seeing changes. And I believe that uh, if in my small corner, or in my grand small corner, Will will be able to make a change. Uh, that will be a very great change. And look at where we are positioning our parks. They are very strategic. Yeah. They are densely populated. And when you enter into those communities, there's nothing much there to be done. And we're changing lives. And if 30 million Ghana City 
in some corner in Teshi, within, you see, if you want to develop sports, especially football, um, it, it, it's not immediate. immediate. Yeah. Yeah, the return you, is not immediate. You, yeah. The return is not immediate. You, you, you have to have the liver to be able to do it. If not, you will break. And if you don't see the future, it's very difficult for you to do it. And if you go into supporting or trying to invest in it for sure, believe you me, you will break down the line. It is very expensive, but if you look at a young man running up and down the field, with natural talent, something supposed to touch your heart. Mm. So those are the things I look at. And um, I was once a street child, so it's easy for me to identify myself with the guys down there. Um, I was once playing football on the streets, was swimming, was just right here, always playing soccer here. So I really see myself in them. So why now that maybe God had brought me this far, I, should, I shouldn't throw back to, to, to where I'm coming from. And I believe in the youth. I believe in the Ghanaian talent. As I'm talking to you right now, I have a scout in here from uh, Leon. Um, it's coming from uh, Leon from... Uh, Atletico Madrid, she's living on Saturday. She's picking five young, young kids from here. These are the investment I'm talking about. And, and when, she, when she came in, she told me that she had never been to Ghana. She thought there's no talent in Ghana. Every time, she's a French, so she always goes to Senegal, Ivory Coast, oh, yeah. Coast um, all um, the French-speaking countries. So if you look out there, you see more French players than English players. They have been able to market that is it. the French countries yeah. Yeah. more than uh, the Algonquin countries. Yeah. And she said what she saw in my park in Sege, he was surprised. He said our players, the Ghanaian players, play with Fenex, and they listen to coaching. This is my first time hearing this. Well, every time I, I, I went onto the field, I keep shouting and shouting. I think that. <laughs> <laughs> I keep shouting. <laughs> 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 Don't do it, there's something good in here. And um, she gave a good account of what she saw. And she said she would prefer to come here than Senegal. So um, I believe in Ghana. I believe that uh, we came to meet problems, but I don't want us to sit down and be bring over our problems. In our small way, we can be able to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very, very insightful. Very insightful, Dad. Let me come to Neil Armstrong now. Uh, Neil. You have been a fan. In fact, you are the head of Heart of Folk Fan Group, the supporters group once upon a time. It's the chapters. The yeah, chapters. the chapters. Yeah, yeah, you are also the chief executive officer of Accra Heart of Folk. Mm. And for a very long time, you have worked with various Ghana Premier League clubs and even worked with FIFA, you know, as a marketing consultant. My question to you, as your, your opening remarks, is that What's, what, I mean, reflecting all these years that you work in, Ghana, in, in the Ghana Premier League, in, in Ghana football industry, say over a decade now, what will be, what's your reflections? What, what, what's your assessment of the league within the last 10 years? Well, I wish you'd given me this question before I came and sat here, but uh, I'll still try and give a few reflections. But I'd like to say it's a good forum that we have. Uh, and uh, listening to... Uh, Mr. Macaulay was very, very inspiring. And the school of thought that I reckon he comes from is one that I belong to. And that's a solution mindset. And I might digress a little bit from your direct question on the Premier League over the last 10 years because I believe in statistics, I believe in research. And if I'm not clothed with the level of research I need to do the kind of analysis I should do on the question you asked, I might do a disservice to your listeners 
and to your viewers. And that's why I may make some general comments on it, but I'll draw from what Mr. McCullough came from. Solution mindset. You know, I've been following this game since I was a kid. I lived in Osu and became a Heart of Folk supporter at almost birth. And I also went to the stadium in the days, heady days of 77, when we played a certain half-year club of Guinea, and the stadiums were always full. Yes, they were full. Come to 79, Union Douala, the stadiums were full. Even up to when I became managing director of Hearts of Folk, as recently as 2013, we got a record crowd at the stadium. And so the question you ask about the last 10 years of our league, uh, is, I'll say it's a hydra-headed hydra question. But Mr. McCauley talked about solution mindset, and that's what I want to focus on. And with the greatest respect to every Ghanaian listening to me here, I want to put it on a very subjective level. I think we talk a lot and do very little. And that's the problem, not only of Ghana football, not only of Ghana sports, it's the problem of this nation. Mm -hmm. That's why Mr. McCauley says it's about solution, solution, solution. I started writing and talking about Ghana football in like 1990. Four, don't ask me how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that's when, I mean, yeah. the consciousness came to make a contribution around that time. And so, I, I'm, I, like I said, I'm a phobian, so I'll go for house of folk meetings, a lot of things happen. But you just want to see where can you bring a solution? Where can you help to make this better? And to preface my opening remarks, it's just to appeal to everyone that is in this room Listening to Joy FM, listening to all your sister stations and watching Joy News. Ghanaians, we need to look to become part of the solution. We've been part of the complaining gang for too long. Too long. Yeah. It's time for us to become part of the solution. Mr. McDan, I salute you from the bottom of my heart. I want to commend you for what you are doing, not only for Ghana football, because I also follow you and follow the stuff that you do. It's this kind of mindset that will develop our nation. So many young people live in this country for all manner of reasons. Our football talent leaves this country for as little as 1,000 United States dollars to go and play in Ethiopia. That is the problem. How do we cure it? You talked about why are people leaving, why are corporate Ghana not coming in here? <laughs> corporate Ghana want to see a brand that they can associate with. And that's why I will commend this effort. That after we had 2019 announced number 12, we all remember that 77 of our referees were caught on record doing stuff that didn't enhance the integrity of our game. Fast forward to a little in 2020, COVID-19 hit Ghana. Our president, His Excellency Nana Kufuado, shut down football. For two years, almost two years, our football was comatose. There was nothing happening. So when Tony Yeboah says Ghana football is dead, I can understand him. When he talks about some of the ills of our game, I'll be the last person to run away from them. Because as House of Oak MD, I could get a call from a referee before a game and say, Hey, Papa, what's up? <laughs> I'm refereeing your match this weekend. What wow. is the referee calling me to say this? <laughs> yes. Wow. And so when you have those conditions, and I talked about 2019, and the number 12 expo say 77 referees. And then COVID-19 strikes us. And after that, with a brand as solid, as dirty as our football, a certain young man called Kurt Edwin Simon O'Crack, when I, I, I've had debates with him about stuff that I think is not working well with Ghana football. But if I want to salute him, when I say I salute the FA, is that in spite of all these problems, solution mindset, from four sponsors, the FA ran to 24 sponsors. This is after all the negativities. 20 sponsors added. A sponsorship income of 2.3 million Ghana cities increased to 23.1 million Ghana cities. 909%. In spite of all the negativities, is that solution mindset I call all of us to. It's easy to see the problem. It's easy to complain about it. So come to our league. Ten years ago, I was MD of House of Folk, 2013. Okay, they didn't last for too long. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, life happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. $150 million loan when a young Brazilian boy with two feet <laughs> moved from one club to another club for 220 million euro. What is football to us in Ghana? What is football to us 
in Ghana. That's I land on purpose. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, if we understand the place of purpose for our football, these conversations will be useful towards re resulting in action steps mm. that will make us work and use football to change the lives of this nation. My opening remarks. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> It's fair to say we've given you a tip of the iceberg of what to expect. We have at least some uh, 50 plus minutes more to delve into the conversation and also to hear from you because you're going to be part of the conversation, those of you uh, in the studio here. And also those of you listening to us on Joy 99.7 FM or watching us on the Joy News channel, you can also be part of the conversation. Just uh, head to Twitter and send us your messages there. It's time for us to acknowledge some of our invited guests, some people really, really important, have made time to be here with us. And Muftar, uh, I'm sure you have a list of some of our invited guests who made time to join us here. Yes, I, I do. Um, uh, thanks very much, um, Ms. Ba. We have Dr. Kansin Penke, is it Penke? Right. Lecturer, Jimpa Business School and Procurement Specialist. Thanks very much for your time. <laughs> I apologize if I didn't get the name right. <laughs> <laughs> Kansen Pente. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, very important. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> and uh, uh, Dr. Maxwell Ampong, uh, Maxwell Investment. Thanks very much for your time. <laughs> Gerald Mojri, Kota Kofan. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> and uh, we also have. Uh, Mr. M.S. Bonnie with us, his group chairman, OBZ Group Ghana Limited. Thank you very much. Domi. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, also, um, Evangeline Na, Presby University. Thank you. Uh, Ebenezer Nto, uh, Presby University. Um, Madame Gloria Okwe, Presby University. <laughs> Daniel Abedi, Presby University. <laughs> Papu Adote, thank you, thank you very much for your time. Also from Presby University, Felix Paco Thompson, so so here with us. Uh, Ni KK Ansa. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Imawa Ni Amate Fio. Thanks. Thank you very much. And Dr. Edwin Echampo. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, let me just say a quick one. Iran applause for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, doctor was talking about being solution-minded. One thing he didn't mention, and I want to mention on his behalf, if I have your permission, is the fact that I have the privilege of covering three tennis tournaments he's brought to Ghana. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when, when you mentioned that Jerome is a Kotoko fan, uh, I just wanted to mention, if he's not aware, that his team finally won a game today. <laughs> 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 finally won a game today. <laughs> yeah. Finally won a game today. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting. And, oh, okay, he actually watched the game. So, nice. Uh, let's come back to the conversation now. Let me come back to you, uh, Gary. Yeah. And... Um, being progressive about the conversation. As a journalist, though, you know, I, I'm thinking, yeah, some say because of the money, Cristiano Ronaldo found himself in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. But some way, somehow, he wouldn't have necessarily played in Saudi Arabia had there not been certain other things there. Because yes. Yes. it's easy to say it's because of the money, but there are a few other things that also attracted him there. Likewise, Neymar, likewise, Henderson, you know, likewise, Sadio Mane. What is it from where you sit as a journalist that needs to be done within the Ghana football environment to make the game competitive, attractive, and also to dominate the content space within the media environment? Because 
the criticism we sometimes get. This is, this is, this is a very, very loaded question. Yeah, I mean. I'll unpack it very, very briefly. Um, first, with a word that Mr. Armstrong Motabe has used repeatedly in his opening submission. It was a question of purpose for Saudi Arabia. And also, they built on what they had already from there. So as I established in my preamble, there was a bit of data that said that the population of the country was young. They needed to be kept busy. They had money to spend, and so they needed to spend it on something. Right. Now, the other thing about Saudi, which we are using as our case study basically today, is that they can lay claim on being a football nation as well, first of all, just like Ghana. Saudi Arabia are a football nation at heart. So if you go to Asia, you cannot possibly mention the top three football nations in Asia and not mention Saudi Arabia. Indeed, the clubs that we have suddenly become all very aware of in the Asian region were the top boys, right? So Al Hilal, um, Ronaldo's Al Nasser, and others. So the smaller ones like Al Tai which there's a Ghanaian there, Bernard Mensah, you know, and others. But they have a big six clubs, just like we have a top three, top four here, traditionally, Hearts, Kotoko, um, Ash Gold, I mean, historically, Olympics, pardon? Yeah, and, and uh, maybe two or three others. Media, Media. Media. well, no, <laughs> historically. <laughs> so maybe Saudi Arabia, and you see, because they had that, they decided to lean into their strengths. And I have always said that despite our challenges with our economy and all that, I've always remained fulfilled or optimistic of the view that sports can be that change because even in my lifetime, I have seen it do a 180 for the country, even in our bad economic times. I have seen it in my lifetime. Right. 2008 Africa Cup of Nations, people forget that in the six years preceding that was Mali 2002, which was a disaster for the national team. Black Queens had qualified for the 99 World Cup, but following that, not much had happened in the women's football space. Hearts of Oak and Kotoko had dominated to a certain extent on the continent, leading to Hearts winning the Champions League, and then, you know, Confederations Cup, Heart and Kotoko became the, there was all that. But then they, they came a law, you know. Through the 2008 AFCON, we used that as a touch paper to set off the very thing that Saudi is doing. So it's not like we have not done it before. It is not like we have not done it before. And which is why I am hopeful that this conversation we are having is not a waste of time. Saudi leaned into their area of strength, which is that they were a football nation. They had a huge football culture already. Now, this is in contrast to a place like Qatar. And this is important. The reason why Saudi decided that this year they wanted to do all the magical things they are doing is that they basically looked at Qatar and said, how is Qatar with, and Qatar does not have a football culture at all, at all. So how has Qatar with no football culture been able to lobby its way to organize the biggest football competition in the world? And we, who have more than 50 years of football culture, Qatari clubs, I mean Saudi clubs, have histories where three generations have supported the teams. You know, like, Neil has talked about, um, Prof. Hinson says his father took him to House of Four Games. Prof. Hinson, likely, if Ghana football were certain, we would have been taking his child. They have had that repeatedly. But because, you know, they have not had the economic problems that we have had and they've had a plan, they've had it back to back to back. So today, you will find people in Saudi, two, three generations, going to the stadium, grandfather, father, and son. So they lean into that and say, as for the football culture we have, what don't we have? And then they started itemizing the things. So they decided, all our kids, and I've given you the demographic of their kids, 
are not supporting the Al Nasser and things because on their TVs are Premier League. La Liga, Bundesliga, all the best players in the world are those that the children of Saudi Arabia wanted to emulate. So they sat down and said, ah, but this Ronaldo that all these our kids want to see, how much do we need to bring him? Right? So this Mbappe crowd that we have our own proper Saudi league that our children, they are not even minding our people. And they, how much do we need to bring him? And then they decided that if Qatar has been able through lobbying as of 2010, 2012, get the rise to the World Cup, they who had the football tradition, they had more money than Qatar anyway. Remember, Saudi Arabia has a susu box. They have a susu box. They have a savings account, which they call the PIF, the Public Investment Fund, of about, let me get the figure right, $776 billion. That is their susu box. It's just $776 billion. That's their susu box. So when they are broke, I mean, I don't even think they'll be broke, but you get the point. <laughs> so they decided... We have the stadia. We have the teams. We have the tradition. We have the money. We have the TV stations. We have the power. All we need now is to get the players to come here so that our children who think that, and because Saudis have money, they could afford to take planes and go to England every week and go. So they said, you know what? Let's bring these guys here so that our children will watch them in our own stadia. In the case of Ghana, we may have fallen on hard times now. But again, people older than me will remember a time where, and again, this is in my lifetime, we attracted the best talent in the sub-region into this country. And we were not the richest in the country. We leaned into something that Dr. McCauley has spoken about and Mr. Motabi has spoken about as well. Our unique selling propositions that, Ghana is a peaceful place. It's a big thing we can sell to these other players. Because rather than, and with the greatest of respect to our cousins Nigeria, if you weighed every situation on its merits, pound for pound, and you gave the average African the choice of going to Nigeria or coming to Ghana, they would come here. Right? Why? I mean, they can go out of Labadi Beach at this time, 10 walk on the street, and the chances of being marked are lower. You're, you know, so safety is a big deal. If you will give them a certain amount of money that they can eat and take care of their families, they will come here. And we've done it before. So when we were bringing Valentina, Tem, and all these guys, it was just in the 2000s. Pardon? Sulama Abdullah of blessed memory and you know, all these guys. So it's not like we have not done it before. Now, what again Saudi did was once they decided that we can bring these players here, they made sure the infrastructure was okay. And that is where they will beat us now. Because Ronaldo is not going to play on a sand park. He's not, Neymar is not coming to play on a Sakura park. <laughs> Benzema is not going to play on a Kotobabi Swag park. <laughs> or Ashama Sakasaka Park. You know what I'm saying? Or Kumasi Abuabo, Ichle Hono, the park be war. You know, or go to um, Tamale, what's the name of this famous park? Kaladan Park. Or Jandu Park. Don't come and play there. So that is why I am excited that people of the ilk of Dr. Daniel Macaulay are building those frameworks. Dr. Kwame Che has done a very bossy thing, in my opinion. Look, that facility he has built at, uh, what's the name? I always forget it. At Brankese. It's a bold and daring thing he has done. Because, for God's sake, what, what is that at Brankese? You know, there's nothing there. But he's thinking many, many years ahead. And for those of us who don't have his money, we say that the Papa Edian Oye. You know, but he's see, he seeing something that we are not seeing. And those people are called visionaries. So, I would 
ally or tie my cloth also to that of Dr. Daniel Macaulay and Neil in answering your question to say that the reason why we chose Saudi is that if you look at the things that in near to their benefit, which were the catalyst for what they are doing now, we are not too far ahead. We only have to decide that as a people, we are actually doing it. So just to sum up, the football culture that will engender, we have it. It was only, you see, we have short memories. It is only two seasons ago that in this country, Accra Heart of Oak and Great Olympics was so oversubscribed that we broke gate in this country. It was here. At the midst of COVID. It was COVID. Like, the government was even begging people, like, you, you understand what I'm saying? It was such a big match that the COVID team, what was they called? The COVID, uh, the, the organization that was taking care of COVID, were basically debating whether the GFA should open the match. You recall, whether they should open the match for people. And this is only two years ago. So I am saying that if we are, for listeners on Joy FM and viewers on Joy News, if we have chosen Saudi Arabia, it is a very good example for us because maybe, I mean, England and Spain and things, you know, their GDPs are bigger. But we can really compare ourselves to Saudi because literally three, four years ago, they were where we are now. But they decided on the solutions mindset as well. And they are where they are. I hope that answers your question, Chief. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Gary, thanks very much. Let me come to Prof. Um, Prof, you know, Gary mentioned a staggering figure that is in the Susu box of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> we might not have that. We might not have $700 billion at our disposal. But definitely, there might be some marketing and branding concepts that we could begin to implement to, you know, uh, grow our football economy to the level where it is able to contribute like it did in England in 2021-22 season, $10.4 billion to the economy in England. You're a marketing person. What can we do as a nation, marketing-wise, to project our football to become such an integral part of our economic growth? I truly appreciate the positive mindset on the panel and um, I want to go back to Neil's issue about purpose. Like, what, what do we want? Because fundamentally, marketing success is predicated on defining what you want. The AstroTurf is brilliant. The University of Ghana is finishing stadium after what? 11, 12, 13 years. Yeah. We are nearly done. So in the scheme of things, is there a certain infrastructure ecosystem we need in order to even come near Saudi Arabia? We are. We, that, that's why I said it's the one thing that Will, will be a minus for us. Because Brilliant. if we want all these players to come, they certainly will not come and play. On, so that is what we, I think we urgently need to fix. Brilliant. Yes. So in a solution spirit, is there any public-private methodology we can come up with where if government can provide a certain quantum, yes. we throw in the private entrepreneurs we throw in the investor of Ghana type stadiums and, and eventually have a certain plan that gives us a certain infrastructure stock by a certain time because that's what we need as a basis for carrying this agenda forward. Mm. So somebody should be thinking through this medium to long term and saying, okay, so what do we do? He, he made a point about how the stadia is in population dense areas because in his mind, he's trying to stop a situation where the youth indulge in vices that can be put off because they are doing sport. Mm. He said he read Baokem, and I thank God for his life, my senior prefect. But <laughs> for me, <laughs> I always go back to the strategy and insight. See, marketing is not just believing God and, you know, just shooting. I don't, marketing is scientific. Yeah. So, so to, to the extent that we have a sense of the youth dynamics like you spoke to it, what we want to do with the youth in terms of empowering them and building a certain type of youth, the infrastructure uh, platform we need. And even the marketing thinking within the various players in the space. 20 years ago, I was with Joel. We were doing House of Folk, Jesse. Those days, it was and we were trying to sort of find out how we could take proposals to companies to get them to sponsor House of Folk. This is 20 years ago mm -hmm. in Adabraka, <laughs> behind O'Reilly Secondary School in Originate. So it's not as if we, we, we haven't made attempts. But I think that from club level to uh, policy making level, mm -hmm. We, we need marketing thinking all across. 
Because at the end of the day, we also need to be commercially viable. All this is not just believing God to, to put up infrastructure. At the end of the day, Daniel must, must make some money. I mean, it he might does. not be short term, but even with a long term horizon, at a point, we need some payback. So for me, we need to start defining at a very basic level what exactly is the football product in this country. Is it just the players? Is it just the pitches? Or is it all the merchandise and the memorabilia? There's a discussion to be had around all that. 20 years ago, I went to Singapore. I was working with Honorable Kwamna Bartels. I was technical advisor for innovation and entrepreneurship. So I got into Singapore and we were watching football at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And everybody was watching. The, the pubs were full. They were watching Premiership. Oh, <laughs> Premier League, yeah. Exactly. I remember there was a shop in front of our hotel where they were selling Man U t-shirts for $99 a pop. It was full every day. And the shirt is 40 pounds in the UK. Why is it $99 <laughs> in Singapore? Because in Asia, the following is unimaginable. So they built a brand to the point where it's being consumed internationally even more than at home in terms of merchandising and memorabilia. Mm. So I think marketing at a local level, club level, marketing to build a brand on the continent, marketing to build a brand globally is something we should think about. From the Ghana Tourism Authority to the Export Promotion Authority to the Investment Promotion Center to Free Zones, all the agencies in Ghana are responsible for marketing Ghana abroad. Maybe sports should be part of the, 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 the Ghana mix we, we send out yeah. at a very conscious level. So that it's not just we are hoping, we are hoping. It should be part of it because what I've also realized is that unlike South Africa, that's for instance, brand South Africa, we don't have a concerted singular nation brand proposition. Okay. So GIPC has its own thing. GP has, and I'm not saying it's good or bad. Please, I'm here to, I, I like to peace. So I just here to sort of, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't have a commentary on whether it's good. I'm just saying that. Yeah, just stating the fact. I'm just stating the fact. And exactly. I'm saying that to the extent that we don't have one brand Ghana office, okay. let's try and include sports or football into the GIPC proposition, into the export promotion proposition, into free zones, into Ministry of Foreign Affairs, into Ministry of Trade. Anytime we get the chance to engage and look for investments and build solid business cases for getting the investments to take the football agenda for it. I think that kind of thinking would grow the brand locally and then make us internationally relevant as well. Just to... Uh, Go ahead. So, to throw the... To pick it back. The, yes. through, the true pass to me. Of, absolutely. Uh, to use it... Then uh, pass through uh, the channel. Uh, I'm running into <laughs> it and I'll give you a cut back. Go ahead. <laughs> now, you may have noticed that in the past two years, I believe, the Black Stars and all our national teams, when they are traveling, they have Visit Ghana yeah. on their thing. Yeah. In fact, Visit Ghana, just to point that. Go ahead. So Visit Ghana is part of the sponsors of at least the Black the Stars, Black and, Stars. The, yeah. and the Black Queens. So okay. The yeah, it's part, they are part of it. Interesting. Uh, on the kits of the national team, there's actually Visit Ghana on it, on the training kit. Who, who, who is behind it? Which, which agency is behind it? I, I can't, but because you mentioned that we should include it into our tourism mix. I get it. Yes. I get it. I get so, it. So, I don't know to what extent that has gone. Interesting. But I know that, you know, it's been, I mean, you, when we went to the World Cup, you saw in all the pictures that we had the Visit Ghana. Interesting. On it as well. So, I know that, uh, what's his name? Is that Kwesi Ajiman? Yeah. Yes. He's, okay. he's, he's a part of the, the F or the management committee of the Black, of the Black Stars. Stars. And yeah. so that is how they bring the, the tourists, the Visit Ghana element into it. Interesting. If you look at all the Black Stars games on the, um, the billboards, the boards there, okay. as part of the sponsors, there's always Visit Ghana. So take, take So it. two yeah. years ago, I was sitting in Kigali. I was Deputy Vice Chancellor at the of Kigali. And anytime you saw Paul Kagami speak about the Visit Rwanda thing, it's as if it is his best. It's like he's intentionally interested in making the Rwanda brand grow yeah. because of us. And the pride with which he speaks about it was always very refreshing because a president is supposed to be a very big person who doesn't really have time. No, 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 he has time. And he speaks about it in ways that suggest that from the very top of the country, yeah. they are interested in projecting the nation brand using a vehicle which is foreign but still football. Sure. So I'm sort of saying that there are so many innovative ways of doing these things. We just need to be expansive in how we think about it, and marketing can take us forward. Mm. Prof, uh, let me come to uh, uh, Dr. McCauley. Uh, you're a business person, very rooted in business. It's fair to say that, uh, to a large extent, all the money 
is with your crop of people, the business people. I'm sure when Neil was MD, he was, he was knocking on your doors <laughs> and a few others to get money from you. You know, but, you it, right. <laughs> yeah, it, but it doesn't come easy. It doesn't come easy to get your money because just uh, a few days ago, the uh, member of parliament for Takwa and CM, and in fact, the, uh, the, the chief executive officer of Midiama were appealing to Goldfields who had withdrawn their sponsorship for oh, Midiama. Wow. You know, and they were appealing to them to reconsider their decision. So my question to you is, what can the states do to help you business people to find it attractive, attractive yes. to give money to Kumasiya Santikos, to give money to Midiama, to give money to Dream Sefsi? Would that have a Yeah, and would that have a Or Great Olympics. Or Olympics. Great Olympics. Hello Olympics. You know, the question... <laughs> You know, the, the question here is, uh, let's be careful not to get ahead of ourselves. Mm. I always believe you work with what you have. That's true. Yeah. And I also believe in leadership. The leadership. What is killing us in this country is leadership. And um, why would somebody sponsor something? There must be an interest. Of course. Yeah. The strongest word in the dictionary is interest and how you see the future. Um, what had killed our game in Ghana, I don't really agree with Tony Yeboah. Okay. Uh, and I bet to differ. Our, our football is not dead. I remember about seven years ago, I gathered all those who started course in Ghana, mm. not the players, mm. but the owners. Okay. I brought them here. We organized a course. I started a course. I revived the course league in Ghana. Okay. Why so? I had an extra turf, but I asked that we should play the course league on the, on the Sakura Park. There's something called culture, memory. You start from there. Why will somebody take you serious? My mother said, if you don't take yourself serious, who should take you serious? The only thing I support in the world apart from Oli is Nottingham Forest. <laughs> <laughs> I have been an ardent supporter of Nottingham Forest when Nottingham was in even the third division. Oh, okay. Why? Because I want to buy that team. Wow. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. okay. I, I want to buy Nottingham Forest. Imagine with all this development going on. McDonald buy Nottingham Forest, and every time you see about 60% of the players in the English leave from Ghana. Yes, it, it, it sounds strange, but just think about it. Not for myself, but you're advertising Ghana. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sales point. And the, that is where talent. So just imagine Nottingham Forest once win EPL with 60% of the, team, of the players from Ghana. If you look at the Saudi Arabia model, they are ahead of us in terms of finance. So they can choose to bring the people home. We can have a talent basket from here and control the world. Um, whenever I talk about leadership, a lot of people think it's an easy thing. Leadership is not an easy thing. If you want to drag government into business, into football, there must be what we call deliberate effort by government. It must be a deliberate effort by government and the political leaders to say this is the dream, this is where we're going. Yeah. Why should Kagami sponsor us now? Rwanda on their shirt. I'm not a marketing person, but there is the need 
to sell your country. Of Football has sold Ghana than any other product in Ghana. Where are we coming from? I'm a businessman. By 2030, Saudi Arabia wants to push $22 billion in football. Yeah. By 2030, we're talking about uh, seven years from now. And I know they'll go beyond that with the way they have started. What are we doing? What are we, run what are we running with? What do we have? We have raw talents. I'm a businessman sitting here. How many talent am I developing every year? If you go to Sege Adan, I have bought 150 acres. I'm building a whole sports village. Four football park, including grass, tartan track, a football academy, 12 tennis court with a center court, a gym, a boxing arena, including a sports clinic. The only place you can get a good sports clinic is in South Africa. There's going to be one here. So, you all know, before McDonald's will say he's doing something, he's done already. So, you will soon see. You, if you go through Sege right now, you will see what is going on there. It's the biggest astro theft. But I don't, if you look around the world, some countries are still playing on grass. Mm -hmm. So I'm building grass courts over there right now as we speak. So how do we develop the game? How, how do we create the talents? Well, I started with charity. I would turn it into business. Why do I want to do that? To attract to have people interest, to be able to maintain the consistency. You must have business approach to whatever you're doing in this country. That's why I say, don't let us get ahead of ourselves. Um, we talk, but it's about time we walk the talk. How do we walk the talk or talk the walk? This is our country. And the, the talents are just everywhere. I will also put the blame on the part of the journalist. It's about time. You slow down. You slow down a bit on the English league, the German league. The, I mean, you, 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 you watch what is going or you look at what is going on. You talk one hour about English league and talk five minutes about Ghanaian Lake. Make it an effort to promote the game. It's not going to come easy. Don't think people are not listening. People love the English game. No. The way you can, have, you can pick one player in Oli, one player in Kotoko, one player in Adriana, and just hype them up. Before you see, the stadium are getting full. Have a strategy as journalists. So I'll throw this also to the marketing people. Um, I think you are thinking too big. Come home. Come home and let's take it one day at a time. What do we do? How do we fix um, the media space? You know, if you can, I mean, just take an ordinary player. The who we started the league, Oli had not considered any goal. But nobody is talking about it. Kotoko is swallowing all the goals. Who is talking about it? <laughs> you understand? It's a marketing point. Yes, it is. We need to develop the game. That is when we can look at model. The Saudi Arabia model is fantastic. And they, they started with their culture. Yeah. They were able to employ the best coach. But even in Ghana, even if we get the best coaches, we can't even tell that this coach 
It doesn't need one or two years. It needs to be consistent. It needs yeah. the support of yeah. everybody yeah. to be able to build the team. The team. Okay. If your coast league break, you can't, you can't win any cup yeah. from the Black Star level. That is why McDan has gone down and building talent. Just, just, just doing what I can. If you look at uh, um, the players we have here, very skillful. Very skillful, but they lack stamina. Stamina. So what are the journalists and the marketing people looking at? How many um, football scouts do we have in Ghana? We have to have, have a whole plan that we build uh, um, scouts in Ghana. Mm. We build people who go out there to look, for to look for talent and sell them and bring them home and be around the teams and give advice to directors of clubs and all that that will grow. So for me, football is a billion dollar business. And we need to take football very serious here because we have it. We, what we have, we don't know we have it. But if you look at what McDan is doing also, it has to do with bringing the children together who turn out to be bad later on, give them something to do. I'm going to build Olympic champions from Ada. So I'm building a Tatan truck. The Tatan truck alone is costing me $2.2 million. So why am I doing it? Yeah. Just ask a young man from Labadi here to jump every day from the age of 12. Just jump. I'll pay you. I'll give you money. Just keep jumping. If you jump 10 meters today, tomorrow, jump 10.1, 10.2. Within four years, he will win, he will win Olympic medal for you. So why don't we see these simple things? That's why I talk about leadership. It doesn't take much to do some of these things. And Ghana, we are talk about um, comparative cost advantage. We have it. We have it seriously. So it's about time we leverage on what we have than getting ahead of ourselves. See, when you set a target that you cannot meet, it frustrates you. So let's set achievable targets, realistic targets that this country will be able to. In your small corner as a journalist, where you are sitting, I mean, before you go to the studio, just say to yourself that I'm going to talk about Ghana. And stations, stations are picking it. I see what you do. Pull down the betting a bit and talk about the talent. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you, so the leadership you speak about is at different levels. It's right? at different it's levels. Different, different levels. It's yeah. diff no, 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 no. I mean, at different levels okay. of leadership. That's fair. That's fair. So for me, where I'm sitting as an investor, at the same time, philanthropists, I want to see a change. I want to see a very big change in this country. And I know that uh, I'll live to see that big change. Thank you. Let, let, let. On the journalist matter, yeah. um, since the chart from the businessman is that every day when you are going to work, think of Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking we can start some football alumni stories because yeah. there are people who played for Tamale Real United 18 years ago, mm -hmm. probably went to Holland, are back, maybe they are retired. Mm -hmm. I see uh, Stephen Apia Jogan, the investor of Ghana campus all the time. Sometimes I work out with him. So there are some of these people who came from Colts, they came from your, yeah, yeah, yeah. your hearts of folk, your Lee and so on and so forth. So if we start football alumni stories, for instance, they tell you where they came from, mm -hmm. together those who are playing there now, I think it could be a very fertile combination for those who came before and those who are there now. So we can begin to generate some narratives around what's happening locally. And you...
toned down on the, the premiership uh, discussions. Eh? No, he said toned down the betting. The, the betting. The bet <laughs> <laughs> well, interesting. And Prof, just, just to add that, in fact, okay. at Joy Sports, we okay. have such a platform. Okay. We have uh, a program called Prime Take. Okay. I think our last edition was with Wilbur Foss. Fum. Last oh, Friday. Yeah. Is you still there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's good. That, that is yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's it's, it. Wow. It's interesting because, like you say, um, because we are media, it's like you also said it, Doc. It's not easy to do because when you watch our counterparts from England and things like that, and they speak to Oba Fons in Fum, by the time they finish doing the 30 minute package, there are rich pictures from 1950, yeah, exactly. you know, yeah. but I don't move down, found it so difficult. <laughs> and get those pictures. Yeah. Infum is talking about, oh, 1957 went and there's no picture to show. Yeah. You know, so I, we hear what you are saying. It is not easy to do and it can be frustrating, but, you know, we can only encourage ourselves and each other mm -hmm. because it's Ghana we have. I mean, um, again, in the last three years, for those who have listened to Joy FM in particular for 26 years, you know that the 6 o'clock news is untouchable. News night, right? Mm -hmm. We believed in the Ghana Premier League, and this coincided with the return of, you know, after Anas, mm -hmm. where there were workshops and people said, you guys should do better. And we, we took it to management and said, management, you see, the people say we are only talking about problems. So we should be part of the solution. So Ghana Premier League is coming. Mm. Mr. Kersio Kreku says, uh, bring back the love. Media, we are, starting, we, we are starting afresh. So what did we do? We started, we canceled the 6 p.m. news. And this coincided with when the Ghana Premier League was doing the nighttime matches. <laughs> when Ligon Cities was playing at 6 p.m. and bringing Shatawale and mm, mm, those mm, ones. Mm, mm, you know, mm. that season was really hot because there was a lot of hope and people thought it was new. So we started doing games at 6 p.m. Why did we stop? We stopped because um, after a few weeks of doing it, and it was great, you know, Ghana people love their hearts and only if you plug into it and you give it to them, they'll they will take, take it. it. Oh, yeah. they, they'll, they'll take, take it, it yeah. yeah. We were doing it for about three months, I believe. Then one day we told our joint news team that, oh, this Wednesday, we won't do the news night. So leave the time for us, six o'clock. We'll, we'll do commentary from the stadium. We were getting our technical team to get the, <laughs> the staff to the stadium. Then somebody on our team said, ah, the GFV has issued a statement that the game has been, mm. <laughs> has oh, been canceled. Wow. So it happened once. Then if you recall, COVID, um, Heart of Oak had a big game against Adriana Stars. It was one of the title decider matches in Doma. We were, I mean, we believed in it and it was exciting. So it was helping us as well because our audience who loved the 6 p.m. news felt that the Ghana Premier League commentary was compelling enough that they understood that we were taking the news off because the games were nice. So there was Heart of Folk versus Adriana in Doma. We were heading to Doma, and we got a statement from the GFA that has, you might remember this, that Heart of Folk, six players or so had COVID, and so the game had been canceled. Wow. But that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, so that's, that's the okay. point I want to make is, <laughs> it's, it's not easy, and so because, you know, I mean, well, uh, it's, it's, it's a business yeah. as well. You can't be canceling programs and things like that. And so we took the executive decision that until the GFA and, you know, or the other stakeholders were able to assure us of consistency, we were not, because what it meant was that once we had taken the news off, we now had to play music, you know, which was not the best. So it's not easy. And, and in, in feathering the solutions mindset, you know, we, we have to decide that sometimes it won't work, but we have to keep on. So mm. that, that's just the point I wanted to well, make. Well, interesting. Right, uh, right. Neil, let me just come to you briefly so we can pick some comment from uh, the floor and Muftau just uh, be on standby for us to do that. Neil, and that's a very important point from uh, the angle of the regulatory body, the Ghana Football Association, and even from the clubs, because to be very frank with you, it is difficult to even speak to a player 
in a Ghana Premier League club before a game. Mm. So difficult. Even when you go to cover their training, you even ask permission that I want to just cover your training, just so you can get bureaus for your discussion, they will stop you. You know, that's sometimes a difficulty that the media gets. So, I mean, from having worked as a managing director of a Ghana Premier League club, what, what would be your message to the Ghana Football Association, to the clubs, to help the work of the media? Because whether we like it or not, the media is going to play a critical role in repurposing our approach to the development of football in the country? Well, I mean, your, my advice would be direct. You know, and the uh, province alluded to the fact that marketing thinking. Uh, again, I also come from a marketing, marketing stock, uh, having worked with uh, Unilever in marketing for a number of years. And <clears throat> it's about the paradigms with which my brothers and sisters who work in football work with. You, you were very charitable in saying that you want to interview a player before a game and you have a challenge. When I was MD, we used to have every, every other week we had sessions with the media. Mm. Make a player available, make the coach, head coach available. The PRO is there. Occasionally, I'll sit there as MD. Uh, and it was a way of getting us, the club, closer to our fans through the media. Why did I say we're being charitable? We've been in this country. And my <laughs> brothers and sisters in football may say, Neil, you like repeating this example. But it's worthwhile to say it because whilst um, Mr. Macaulay spoke about the media pushing the, 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 the agenda, it's also the case that, if not all, quite a number of my brothers and sisters in football also create the challenge that I just described. A broadcast team is put together to go and telecast live a game in a venue. I'll not mention any venue <laughs> <laughs> before I get political problems. <laughs> but a venue in Ghana. They get there, the game is advertised as the 6 p.m. or the 3 p.m. game, and that TV crew are told you cannot televise this game because the home team have said you will not telecast the game. And I just give that as one example. I could give several of them. Yeah. So we talked about advice. The advice I give to my, let's say, self and my brothers and sisters in football is if it is that we are saying that our media, our colleagues in the media must project us, then we need to configure ourselves and have a mindset that is open for us to be leveraged. Because without that mindset, a lot of what we are saying here will not be practically done. Yes, sir. The access to the players is through the clubs, not even through the FA. The FA, <laughs> on paper, may say the clubs should do A, B, C, D. But this club prevented the... Uh, TV crew, actually they put a, a trailer or something across the road, a truck. And the TV crew couldn't cross wow. to go and telecast the game. Yeah. Yes, that's serious. Yeah. For whatever reason. I won't go into the reason. So, advice. My brothers and sisters in football, we need to be open. And need to understand that when the spotlight is on us, it actually inures to our benefit. Mm. So may I ask you, what, yes, is, what are the journalists doing about it? About when, when that happened. When that happened. I, think, I, don't, I, don't, I don't quite recall that anything even happened after that. No, no, no. Honestly, no. I don't think so. I would have no, caught at the time. The, the so I, I, recall, shout. Yes. I recall then that... Um, that the was, SWAG take it up? That was, no, that was 2017. What the Ghana Football Association decided was that if a club decides that the broadcast rights holder will not They'll broadcast their match, they will lose three points. Yes, they will sanction them. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the sanction. So, so no, the, I, 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 I asked you that question mm. because... Um, we need to be very serious with the game. Yeah. We yeah. cannot be talking about it. There must be sanctions. Yes. Yeah. yes. There must be serious, serious disciplinary sanctions. 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 So you see, some of these things, huge journalists should be hammering on it. Sure. You can hold, you can hold the Ghana Football Association at ransom. You can strike because of such a thing. Mm. You have to take it very, very seriously. This is not something you should it's joke with. Joke with yeah. No, it's serious. This is how powerful you can be. Yeah. I don't know if I could collaborate for yeah. Go ahead. I think such behaviors need to be properly documented and reported. Yeah. Um, but fast forward, um, given the fact that some of these uh, incidences has the tendency to recur, um, maybe we need to leverage technology in telecasting or 
having those feeds going forward. I was just suggesting to him that uh, you could actually be far away and using drone technology and again. to actually <laughs> pick your games. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yes, yes. let us also yeah. leverage another technology. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just another, take the, another, I think we'll solution, just take yeah. advantage of this to yeah. hear also from yeah. our yeah. audience yeah. Uh, yeah. here, you know, and even yeah. questions. So let's just, uh, if, if you're interested, yeah. yeah. So if you want to add to this, you can just okay, lift so your hands. I can just make a follow up. Yeah. Um, as part of the contributions that has been made, I think the key teams have come out from all the uh, panelists. And that is research, a strategy that is underpinned by research, and that the need for us to be very deliberate. Uh, the idea of deliberateness is something that is very, that I can associate with Dr. McCauley because if you know each other for very long. So as Dr. McCauley referenced the steps he's taken to the extent that it will have a very consistent and sustainable implications on the country, he has a blueprint he's working with. I can tell you that he has a blueprint. He has a strategy and he has a checklist and he's following through and ticking the box. On the back of the strategy, he has a structure. There must be a structure to work with. And so it is important that we, are, we have a strategy in place. And if you take the Saudi case, the research inform a particular strategy blueprint. And there is a very deliberate structure, a permanent structure that is ensuring execution. And so therefore, they will realize the benefit. So I think. Like I said, all of you have actually uh, synchronized or synthesized all the things that I've been thinking about. And I think, I just hope that um, we have a structure in place that is documenting some of these initiatives that we are suggesting in a manner that maybe in the next couple of months we can have a blueprint and have a further stakeholder engagement with all the key actors and begin to look at how we could go to the ground and start the implementation. That's just a few input yeah, I would like to, to make. Fair, yeah. To be fair, just, just, just in the spirit of the solutions mindset, I mean, it, it's important to, you know, so that it's not a, it's not, we are not looking at the glass as only half empty, right? We, we, look at, we can look at it as being half full as well. Um, the, the GFA have tried, especially this administration, to varying degrees of success and failure, yeah. you know, to start some of these things. So they started what they call their Bring Back the Love campaign. Um, they will be among the first to tell you that it started very well, but due to some very Ghanaian factors, you know, it's, it's went down and they've been struggling with it. However, what they've had success with has been what they call the Catch Them Young policy. So in the spirit of having a level playing field, because one of the things that really annoys or really destroys football is officiating, right? So they started, and uh, I'm told that it was a previous policy that they took, but they have taken it to the next level, where children as young as eight years, yeah. nine years, in communities... So, so the structures are being built. Are, build, are being built. That's what I'm, I'm trying to say. Now... In a very typical Ghanaian fashion, you know, we, we want to see instant results tomorrow. And maybe the results of things like the Catch Them Young policy will be seen, because the kids are eight years, nine years. We have all heard yeah. that some of the best referees in Ghana right now are 15 years old. Yeah. And they have consistently, like Jerome, you, you, you've heard, we've heard about, yes, we've heard about some 15 and 14 year olds who have been traveling around the country and refereeing games at a standard that their seniors cannot even believe. So, you know, these things take time. And if we can allow some of these things to happen, you know, but then again, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to say. A few more comments. Uh, Jerome uh, has some comments or questions, if you have any. Yeah, both. Yeah. I like the way Gary started the conversation. In fact, this is the first time I'm hearing how the Saudis started this whole thing. And I'm wondering, you know, I look at the panel here, fantastic panel, but you know where power lies in this country? <laughs> it's with the politicians. Who would think like the Saudis 
uh, uh, the, 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 the bin hamad, yeah, the way he did. Who would do that here? Go into research, pick vital information, and say that on the basis of what research is teaching us, this is where we are taking sports. This is where we are taking football. I think that is missing. And then to Prof, you, you started with some, some bit of negatives. I was waiting to see where or the point you wanted to make with that. I think it didn't come. I just wanted to understand because it's, it's crucial when you have a former sports minister, not just a former sports minister, but someone who has been a sports commentator perhaps all his life, saying the kind of things he said. Tony Eboa, one time go king in the Bundesliga, yeah. Yeah. saying the kind of things he said. And even the MP who has political power, he sits on a, a, a committee of parliament on sports, saying the kind of things he said. I wanted to see where you were going with that. I think that too didn't come. And then the last one, you said interlinkages between FIFA, CAF, and the and local, local FA. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know, but something truncated and you didn't finish those points. Okay. So if you can just round up that. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Okay. So on the first one regarding the negative vibes, the point I was making was that the governing body, uh, GFA, has a huge mountain to climb in terms of people who don't seem to think there's anything good going to come out of this country. Yeah. But that said, like the examples we heard, Abedi Pele and Asamojan can still get you through airports, trust me. I mean, you can be in Brazil somewhere. And just because it's like, ah, you're Abedi Pele's country. And I've heard these things like from several different people in different countries. So football is like a ticket to global access, if you like. And like Mr. Makwati said, it's probably marketed Ghana better than anything we've ever had. So I'm saying that there are people who could be naysayers, but with the right strategy articulation yeah. and the right planning, this thing will work. I mean, it will work so well, we'll be shocked ourselves. Nice one. That's the first one. The second thing is about the interrelationships between the various levels. Please, maybe Neil can help, but when you have FIFA, you have CAF, you have GFA, Wafu, is it alive or dead? It's, 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 alive. it's very alive. <laughs> alive. <laughs> Wafu is alive. It's working, right? The president. No, I'll, I'll just check it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. Yes, I'll just check it. Sorry. So you have you have FIFA, you have CAF, you have WAF, you have GFA. If I've learned anything at all in life, um, politics matters. Yes. And sometimes, if you don't understand the political nuances of how all these things interrelate, you can't be, get the best for your local association. Yeah. So all I'm saying is that we need to sort of understand the way the wind is blowing and sort of because look in life, everybody is jockeying for resources. Yes. So if you don't have a clear sense of what to do to get the best for yourself, you, you will not do too well. Mm. So I'm just sort of sounding a note of caution that we need to understand all the complex football association interview and ensure that Ghana gets the best yeah. given uh, political savvy. So that's the point I saw to sure. Well, interesting. Uh, okay, um, we might just have to do, okay, okay, let's take comments, okay? Comment, just one, one, uh, maybe under 30, 40 okay. seconds, so we could wrap up very okay. quickly. Good evening, as yes, we are speaking, we are talking about how to market the game, make the game very beautiful for us to watch. But what I would like to draw our mind is just the basic needs that makes the game beautiful. You see, there was one time I was watching one of the, uh, the female game, and then a player got hurt, and then there was no stretch to just take care of the pitch. Mm. One of the technical team has to carry the back. Mm. You see, it doesn't make the game beautiful. Mm -hmm. So as we think of how to move ahead, we need to look at this the basic, basic logistics to make the game beautiful. Right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Good point. Wonderful. That's Good point. a good point. Yeah, the basic things That's need to be fixed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have not given... Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we are talking about the Saudi Arabia experience. And you spoke about the Susu box, <laughs> which the Saudi uh, public sure. investment, investment fund, fund. Yes. supported. We may not have it, but my senior man always says that you like I know. the world was spoken into, into being. being. That's correct. Now I'm coming to Doc McCauley. I'm agreeing with you. What our media say about our league yeah. hurts the league a, a whole lot. Oh, and when you say it, they wax lyrical to defend themselves. 
I was watching the nation's TV where Jerome always lives <laughs> and, and my boss Neil. And on this very day, the morning, the, the five something, the five show or something, and they spoke a, a whole lot about the foreign league. Mm. And when they were signing off, then the lady remembered that she said, <laughs> and let's remember that Midyama and the Dreams are playing Africa and um, the, ladies, the ladies team, uh, Ampil Dakwan or something. We spoke about this at the barbering shop. You know, and that was it. And I said, wow. Now, Gary, I'm happy you spoke a lot about what Joy FM is doing to, you know, but don't forget that you have in your fold one person who neutralizes what you do hey. in the person of fireman who would come <laughs> and specialize in tearing down what uh, leadership or authority is doing by calling them thieves and wow. stupid and criminals and all that wow. please let's check that one too thank you thank well thank you, you very much all right yeah so this will be our final comment uh, just uh, <laughs> really 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 I am not really a football yeah. fan. Sure. I came here because a businessman is going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a business student. Congrats. And with everything that I'm, I, and the marketing thing, too, I think I have to understand you. I hear yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> so with everything that you're saying, I like the way you were just speaking figures and facts and yes, everything. Yes. And the research thing. I want to ask you, Professor, uh -huh. how many research projects uh, we've been done there. from university, like by university students, are sitting untouched? Good point. Good point. With we, we, this research thing, I promise you, we can do it. Good we point. can give you the figures. We can give you the facts. Good we point. can give you the technical know-hows. This is how he's going to do it. Like we are going to do it. This is how. But at the end of the day, are the we data? going to do it? That's right. And another thing, <laughs> Doctor. See, I'm I'm super proud. Eh? That I'm, I'm an Adan girl. That's right. Because of what you are doing. <laughs> and and my only fear yeah. is we don't have a good maintenance culture in Ghana. Okay. We are going to say all oh, this. He has done something that is commendable. I wish we have like 10 Dr. Macaulay's in Ghana. That's and I believe that would have changed the country. Right. But at the end of the day, all the things that he has done, five years to come, will it still be the same? That is my only fear, so him, that with the him. money that I know that he has a plan. He has a plan for maintenance and everything Absolutely. because he will not waste his money. He's a Absolutely. businessman. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, as Ghanaians, do we have a good maintenance culture? Are we going thank to you. keep what we have? Are we going to, I mean, yes. Yeah, so. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Amazing. And um, we are... Yeah, I mean, just, just obviously. Um, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> 30 seconds. So you have 30 seconds. Mine is a very quick comment. Quick one. Now, um, have we tackled the legal framework? Mm -hmm. And secondly, to Prof, I was expecting you to talk about rebranding. Of course. But you, 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 you started it, but I didn't, you, didn't, you didn't go deep. Okay. And uh, uh, the legal framework, if uh, in the English premiership, if uh, a team messes up, Mm. It's made to face the full rigors of the law, That's and correct. it's made to bite. Mm. But in Ghana, we have all the laws, but enforcement is a problem. Mm. Some players, they don't even understand a simple contract. So until we establish the legal framework, nothing is going to happen. Mm. Thank um, you very much. Much appreciated. Okay. Uh, look, we're definitely going to continue this conversation ah. on all our platforms. No, one last question. One last question. Uh, one popular one last yeah. OK, popular thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Gary, needs a special. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, your network is your net wealth. I once learned this from Magdan. I think we need to all build more networks. That's yeah. Yes, that's true. As sports administrators. That's true. To be able to at least attract sponsors and mm. investors. Mm. Mm. I remember uh, some months ago, the government came out that they are taxing betting. I was expecting the GFA, and therefore the sports ministry, to come out with figures yeah. as a proposal to government as to why such percentage or percentage should go to a separate account. Yeah. That would be meant for sports. Yeah. Mm. Why do you have to tax betting? 
and use it or send account. it into the national account. Yeah, Interesting. Point. Such tax point. or Thank percentage you. can go into a separate account for sports development. It could be Ghana's uh, public you. investment fund. Yes. Amazing. Let me just say, um, let me just acknowledge Mr. Joseph, who is a crowd rep for Brecum, uh, Brecum Chelsea, uh, Mr. Desmond, and uh, who is the chairman of Brecum Chelsea Supporters Welfare in Accra, Mr. Raphael Edem, who is the executive director at Jubilee Communications, Mr. Latif Abubakar, who is a playwright. Wow, amazing. Good to have you here, Mr. Latif. And uh, Mr. Jake, who is the chief executive officer of Cranium Group, uh, Mary Opoku, who is also a midwife, Anna B. Awumi, who is a cybersecurity analyst. Thank you so much for coming through. And thank you, Gary Al Smith, head of sports. Of course, I'm very sure you agree we're going to continue this conversation on various platforms. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for coming to Doc. We pray that you continue your investment and uh, we'll be there to see the full work at SEGE. And Neil Armstrong, thank you so much also for coming to. And to all of you who listen to us on Joy 99.7 FM and on the Joy News channel, thank you so much for being a part of it. And, uh, for